Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Kind of in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you that when I was fresh out of grad school, uh, I went to work for Lewis and Clark College and uh, taught there for a number of years. So I lived in Portland. And uh, I was a member of this club not terribly long after it was founded. Um, and then when I moved to Ashland, um, I maintained membership for a little bit, came up for a couple swap meets, um, but it just was kind of too far and I was too busy with young kids and so forth. So my membership has long lapsed. And there's only one person that I really remember from the club. Let's see if this thing is going to cooperate in any fashion at all. Um, Orville White was a member of the club um, back in the 60s. And I don't know if anybody remembers Orville. Um, but my wife at the time said that when I went to my great reward, she didn't think I really wanted to go. Where she thought I wanted to go was to Orville White's garage. <laughs> and uh, Orville had a uh, functioning spark cap transmitter and a lot of wonderful stuff. Um, this is not the ideal display situation, but maybe we should try to move this forward just a little bit and uh, see if we can get the thing to kind of better fill the screen and not so much of the wall. Thank you. And, uh, oh, that's great. Oh, that's much better. Yeah, let me see if I can just tilt this thing down just a shade more. So, a um, number of members of the club have been helpful to me. Uh, Mark will recognize the Hoodalls logo on the far left. Um, Sonny Clutter uh, was the source for the KGW microphone photo. Um, uh, Craig Adams, uh, as Mark indicated, um, was a big help um, and had, had done a lot of foundation research, um, establishing dates on some things. Um, the way this book came about was that I was always interested in the history of radio and television and thought I knew a good deal about it. Uh, I had moved to Oregon in 1967. Um, it struck me when I was about halfway through researching the book. Researching and writing the book took about eight years. I was about halfway through it and I realized, well, radio is going to have its 90th birthday in 2012. I'd lived in Oregon for almost half the time that radio had been in existence, thought I knew something about the uh, history of the industry in the state, and was really shocked to discover that virtually all of the really early um, folks who had built stations and taken many times very adventuresome steps and courageous steps, sometimes very eccentric steps, uh, to develop radio were forgotten names. Nobody knew anything about these people. And so it was quite an adventure to kind of go uh, find out what had happened and kind of uncover their stories. Um, uh, this presentation was really put together for bookstores. So there's going to be a few things in it that are things that um, probably would be old hat to you guys. I'll just skip over that stuff. But I usually play this music um, to start, and the reason is that um, it has a significance in the history of radio in Oregon. Um, there were two orchestras that were influential. Uh, one was Herman Kennan's uh, orchestra. They tended to play at the uh, Multnomah Hotel, which at that time was one of the two uh, really premier hotels in Portland. Uh, it's now where the Embassy Suites are on uh, a Third and Pine. But um, uh, and Herman Kennan um, uh, used to play their, their, their major um, uh, dance location in that hotel was uh, the Rose Court. And one of the songs that they recorded was um, based on the Rose Court was in the name. Herman Kennan uh, was kind of a um, partly a musician but he wound up going to the Northwestern School of Law and became an attorney and left music. And <clears throat> does anybody recall who James Petrillo, Jimmy Petrillo was in the music industry? Petrillo was the um, president of the American Federation of Musicians who achieved national prominence when he shut down the recording industry in from 1942 to 1944 in a dispute with broadcasters over royalty payments. Um, there were no records made in the United States of America for almost two years. 
um, which is why everybody listens to a lot of uh, old Lang Syne and uh, um, popular uh, public domain songs. Fertillo was a very um, flamboyant character. Kennan became the president of the American Federation of Musicians following that uh, Petrillo, uh, when Petrillo retired after 25 years. And Herman Kennan was one of the founders of the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, but he got his start in Portland, um, in Portland Radio and KGW. The other orchestra that I usually play is George Olson's orchestra. Olson went from Portland KGW straight to Broadway from 1923, starting out on KGW. A year later, he was a Broadway headliner. He married, if anybody's a student of uh, uh, Broadway or musicals, he married Ethel Shida, who was a major Broadway headliner. And George Olson's major claim to fame, he has many. He worked with um, Bing Crosby and a lot of other greats. Um, he was the composer of Beyond the Blue Horizon, which was a big song in the late 1920s, early 1930s. So Portland Radio had kind of um, some pretty high quality talent at the outset. Um, but radio in uh, radio really got started in the world, and certainly in the United States, as a result of World War I, where um, it had significant military applications. And so these guys who were veterans came back after the war and had just been fascinated by their radio experiences and wanted to try to put this to use in a world in which there was nothing designed for the public. And so things like this, Bill Virgin was a military guy, and uh, his dad owned a um, flour mill in Central Point, Oregon. And so his, he and his friends just put together a transmitter on a breadboard and uh, stuck a tower on top of the shed. And they didn't have a license, and they just went on the air. Um, and it was arguably the first radio broadcast designed for the general public in the state. Um, a few months later, he licensed KFAY, um, which was licensed just a few months after uh, the very first station signed on. And uh, where most stations, well, all stations were non-commercial at that point. Uh, they were kind of promotional devices. Virgin was a businessman, and he actually went out and sold time when this was an enormously controversial thing to do for both legal and social reasons. And uh, the story is Virgin used to go out during the day and sell airtime, and then he'd turn the station on at night and he'd broadcast as long as he had spots. And once the spots were sold, were used up, he signed off. So, uh, <laughs> radio was pretty casual. Um, newspapers played a huge role, and you know. Everyone who kind of thinks about the um, evolution of the internet in the last 10 to 15 years, I think there's some real parallels to the way radio was introduced. Um, except that we all live in a world in which electronic media are so prominent that the differences uh, that the internet brought didn't have uh, quite, it didn't have anywhere near the same power that radio had as a wholly new electronic experience. But the whole idea that it started out kind of technologically geeky and only the little young kids who were willing to really kind of learn this and so forth um, kind of mastered radio and then gradually older folks, parents and grandparents and so forth got to it. Just like the internet, my 86-year-old mother now uses the internet. She's fine, but you know, like 10 years ago, she couldn't have done anything like that. Uh, well, newspapers, in the same way newspapers have kind of taken hold of the internet or tried to, because they figured it was going to replace part of what they did. Newspapers played a huge role in developing radio, and many newspapers started radio stations. There are headlines from a few of them there, um, and, and, and were influential in developing it. Um, early folks in radio, um, the guy on the right is Joe Halleck, and Joe was the father of Ted Halleck, and most folks may know who Ted, Ted had a distinguished career in radio. Uh, he was a DJ and, and later program director, an award-winning program director on KPOJ, then left radio to go into politics. He was the president of the Oregon Senate at the time the Land Conservation and Development Commission was established in 1973, uh, largely wrote that bill. Um, then went back to radio in his retired years a little bit. He was working for KM, was a volunteer for KMHD. Um, Joe uh, was in radio as a kid very, very early and did a lot, did work in the military and started um, 
uh, the he was co-founder of the HaloWatt company. I didn't point it out, but on the first slide, the radio at the upper left was a HaloWatt TR5. And HaloWatt Corporation was founded in Portland and sold radios. Well, this is a picture of Joe standing on top of a 600-foot tower in San Diego, just kind of dancing. Uh, one of the installations that he made. Um, so I love that photo. Um, this one here is Bill Virgin from KFAY in Medford. Um, this is Edgar Piper. He was the editor of the Oregonian. And we'll come back to him in a second as to why he was important in radio. Uh, this is Wilbur J. German, who I think must have spoken to your club on one or more occasions. I read that someplace. Uh, Wilbur was a very young guy with a lot of responsibilities. He built quite a number of radio stations, uh, including KWJJ, which he named for himself. And, um, but uh, he was kind of a contract, he, he was on the employment of Stubbs Electric, and, and Stubbs Electric in early years built radio stations as far away as Calgary, Alberta, and he did that. The guy um, on the lower left is Harry Reid, more about him in a second. This is Stubbs at about the time he got into radio. He, uh, this is German, about the time he got into radio. Um, Wilbur left Benson Polytechnic without graduating because radio just called him and went to work for Stubbs Electric. And if you talk to Wilbur and ask, well, how did you learn how to do all of this? How did you learn how to build radio stations? He would say, oh, I don't know. I just tinkered and picked it up. He never had any formal training. Then there's Harry Reid. So Harry and his brother Walter were kind of the Johnny Appleseeds of radio in Oregon. They built an incredible number of radio stations. Um, Walter was the elder and kind of got his brother interested in radio. They grew up in the Seattle area. And uh, Harry started a station, or was associated with starting a station at the River, KQP, <coughs> which became KOIN when it moved to Portland. And Harry was a broadcaster, he was a private pilot. He had a, an absolutely passionate dislike for utilities and monop utility monopolies. I mean, he hated them. It just offended him to send a power bill, to pay a power bill to the power company to power the transmitter. Um, the power company underestimated him. Uh, when they wouldn't negotiate with him on something, they got really angry. He said, well, I'm going to compete with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, sure. And uh, he later, after the Bonneville Power Administration um, made power available for non-commercial co-op utilities, he founded Salem Electric and was the first president and chairman of their board pretty much until his death. Uh, and it's still going. And the stories about Harry, people collect these kind of like nuggets. Um, Harry, remember, he hated the utilities. So in the mid-20s, 26, 27, 28, remote broadcasts were becoming the thing to do. And it just really offended his sensibilities to write a check to Pacific Northwest Bell for circuits to connect these things up. So Harry figured out a way to do it without the phone company. So what Harry would do, he, one of the stations he found that was KXL in the Multnomah Hotel was on the second floor mezzanine. So, and he owned it for quite a while, after he sold the KOIN. So, uh, Harry would flush a tennis ball with the wire attached to it down the toilet at the station. Then he would go to the remote location and he would attach a wire to a tennis ball and flush the tennis ball down the toilet there. And he had studied the Portland sewer systems to know where these things were going to meet. And so he would go and he would cross connect the wires and voila, he'd have a remote circuit. <laughs> and Harry had remote circuits going all over the city of Portland. Well, I, this story was so bizarre that it had been attributed to a number of different people. I mean, people knew about this, but it had kind of been lost in history a little bit who actually had done it. Well, I, I was managed to source unquestionably that Harry was the guy who did this. What I couldn't quite figure out was how he did it. I mean, how would you actually go and find the wires and yeah. cross-connect them? Well, there's an author. Um, your grandchildren may have read um, some of her work. She's a very prominent children's author, uh, national award winner, Evelyn Sibley Lampman. And um, her husband, 
uh, had been on the staff of the Oregonian for many years, uh, Van Herlampen. And um, I was going through Evelyn's papers because Evelyn um, got her start in radio. She worked in early radio in Portland in the very late 20s until 1951 when she resigned from KGW. And lo and behold, in her papers, I found the drawing of the was used in her book that came out in 1953, which she wrote under a pseudonym, which is a hysterical read, um, about things that had happened in Portland Radio. And all the stuff that's in the book, as bizarre as it is, all really happened. She just changed the names to protect the innocent. And so that's how Harry did it, with a fishing line, fishing pole. He'd go lift the manhole cover up, find the wires, and connect the thing. Um, another Harry Reid story, and you could go on about Harry. He's just quite a character. His, his children, uh, and I don't think this was all that common back then, um, his children always referred to him as Harry, rather than his dad or pop or something like that, which I don't understand. Um, when, he, when the, when, the uh, when KXL was in the Multnomah Hotel, of course, transmitters ran, then ran on pure DC, and Harry didn't really want to have to buy the power. So he figured out that the elevators also ran on pure DC. So he went and he connected his transmitter to the elevator circuit. Well, this worked tolerably well, except in the mornings when there were a lot of people checking out, and in the afternoons, late afternoons, when there were a lot of people checking in, the regulation on the voltages was all over hell and gone. So what Harry had trained his people to do, he had a bank of, um, you know the kind of resistors that look like heating elements that you put in an old um, heater? He had this bank of resistors and you would just unscrew enough of them or screw them in enough that you would get the voltages back to where they were supposed to be, more or less. Um, and. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so that, I mean, that was just kind of vintage Harry Reid. The hotel figured it out, and they made him disconnect the, the circuit from the elevators. But um, Harry almost lost the station license one time. I don't know how he did this. I mean, I don't know how in his mind he would not have understood that this was not something you could get away with. KXL was a 100-watt station. Harry installed a 20,000-watt transmitter which he um, euphemistically labeled the auxiliary transmitter. <laughs> which he stuck up in the attic of the Multnomah Hotel, and there was like a big bypass switch. Well, <clears throat> interference reports started coming into the Federal Radio Commission from all over the West Coast. And, of course, the inspector went out, and um, the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the people were all sort of, oh, no, we never use this, it's just, uh, and the inspector wrote a memo which basically said, it's kind of hard to understand how somebody would install a tra auxiliary transmitter which was capable of producing 20,000 watts with the tubes that were in use for a 100-watt station unless you were really planning to use it. Uh, and so they designated his license, the commission designated his license for revocation Harry threw himself on the mercy of the court, and surprisingly, they let it all go. And he signed an affidavit saying, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> so that's what radio listening was like in Oregon in the mid-20s when radio was born. Uh, that's a family in, in Hood River gathering around the radio. Can't quite tell what kind of radio it is. Looks like it's a two-stage set with a detector and an amplifier uh, linked. Two different boxes. Um, so the Oregonian really made a huge difference in radio. Um, Edgar Piper, the editor, was a radio enthusiast. And the associate editor was Ron Calvert, and he was a radio enthusiast. So these guys were just waiting to see what this was going to be. And in secrecy, um, didn't tell anybody. It was customary for newspapers at the time if they were building a radio station to value it and, you know, we're going to build a station where you have, they just installed the equipment and we're going to sign on in two weeks. The Oregonian was totally silent about what they were doing um, until just a few days before they turned it on. And, uh, and at the time, the Oregonian was located in this building at the corner of 6th and Alder, which had this tall tower, this clock tower. That was the first steel-reinforced building built west of the Mississippi. Uh, and so they stuck this radio station, not knowing exactly what radio was going to turn out to be, up in the tower of the Oregonian building and erected one tower on the roof. 
And then, I don't know how they got permission to do this, but there's a, a bank building that's still there. The other tower was over across the street, uh, across Alder Street, and uh, then the blacktop antenna uh, extended across the street, which nowadays you'd probably have trouble getting permission to do that. Um, and so the Oregonian signed KGW on in March of 1922, and um, it was a very big deal, and they did this in the grand style. It was a very elegant operation compared to what radio was at the time. And that's what their, um, uh, the tower studio looked like when they signed on. Um, you can see the microphone was kind of a horn, a series of horns, and uh, they really didn't have um, microphones in the traditional sense at that time, the microphones that were commonly used for like an announcer would, was a kind of a, a, a converted telephone, candlestick telephone kind of a microphone, carbon button things. Um, one of their very early programs were, and this was kind of like one of the most fun things to explore in doing the book, uh, were the hoot owls. So Edgar Piper was um, on a business trip in December of 1922. It had to have been between about December 6th and December 15th, 17th, whatever. And he was going through Kansas City. And uh, the Kansas City Star had a relationship with WDAF. And um, one of the things that they decided to do was a late night remote from the Hotel Mulebach. Uh, which was the elegant hotel in downtown Kansas City. And the, the band that they had on that time, at that night, uh, that was performing in the hotel was the Coon Sanders uh, band. And they didn't realize that the mic was on and uh, was close enough to catch the comment. And um, either Coon or Sanders, nobody knows which, said and got caught on the radio it, because this was this program that started at 11 15 at night it was a late night band remote he said i don't know who would be up listening to anything this late at night other than a bunch of night owls night hawks and immediately they were deluged with telegrams from people saying i'm a night hawk and i like what you're doing and within a couple of weeks um the coon sanders band renamed itself the Nighthawks, the Kansas City Nighthawks. Um, the program was set up as kind of a formal thing and what they did was they um, encouraged uh, people by t to send in wires and make requests. And when anybody made a request of the band to play a particular song, the announcer who was a reporter who had just been detailed to this, he didn't know anything about radio, he had been detailed to this assignment by his city editor um, would simply acknowledge the, the request came from Joe Smith and whatever, and he rang a gong. And it kind of created a little bit of a special feeling of you know, doing this thing together. Well, Edgar Piper heard this and said, that's a great idea. I mean, what can we do with this radio station that we've created that would have a similar kind of quality and, and kind of assemble a club? And so when he got back to Portland, he sat down with Calvert and a couple other people, and they dreamt up the Keep Growing Wiser Order of Hoodals. <coughs> and the KGW Hoodals were on the air for 10 years, just a little bit more than 10 years. And it's absolutely a remarkable achievement. So the Hoodals had the benefit of musicians who were um, employed by KGW, but all of the other talent for this program was volunteer. So the Hoon Owls, if you could envision what Saturday Night Live would sound like as a radio program, if you put it on the air in the mid-twenties, that's what the Hoon Owls was. They did satirical sketches um, on topics of the day. They had um, major uh, talent, Broadway vaudeville talent that was touring through Portland. Those people came in and performed and they did, they did a live 90-minute program every week. And the people who wrote and performed the program were people that included the Episcopal Bishop of the State of Oregon, the um, general manager of the telephone company, um, the general manager of the electric company, some judges, um, people who were semi-professionals. Um, and they wrote this program and performed it each week. Well, this program had, it just electrified people. People, you can't imagine the scope, the scale of impact this had. While it was carried on NBC occasionally, not regularly, 
It was just being broadcast as a local radio program on one single station. It had listeners all over the world. In Mexico City, when the newspaper, uh, when the, uh, uh, the theater would put a radio on the stage on Friday night and stop the movie so people could listen to the KGW Hoodals. I mean, this was, you know, early in radio, signals traveled much further without interference than is the case now. Um, there were 90,000 members of the Hoodal in the United States, of the Hoodals. They had membership all over the country, presidents, Broadway performers, the Marx Brothers were Hoot Owls. Um, you know how in the newspaper they list you know, your best bets on TV frequently for the evening? The KGW Hoot Owls were listed as best bets all over the country, newspapers across the country. Um, and this was a program that had similar impact um, and popularity to Amos and Andy. And the thing is, it was all done as a charitable deal. It, nobody got paid, and partly because of the Episcopal bishop's role, they used this program to raise funds for worthy causes. And the cause that they particularly adopted was feeding people who were in suffer suffering in the Depression and so forth. It got started in December of 1923 when they worked out an alliance with the Portland police, and the Hoot Owls would would get food to be donated, which the police would distribute. At one point, the Hoodals had their own cannery in McMinnville. Mm -hmm. So the um, farmers would send in the produce, and the cannery would can the produce, and the police would distribute the produce. Well, they started that. It's called the Sunshine Division. Mm -hmm. And it still exists in Portland. 84 years later, is a separate 501c3. They raised funds to put radios in <clears throat> children's homes and hospitals for shut-ins. Um, the whole thing was done as a charitable venture. Um, there are no, the first recordings of programs in Oregon um, were made in 1937 when KGW got transcription equipment. Before that, there are no recordings. Other than, um, this is as close as we can come to what the Hoot Owls sounded like. Um, Harry Granite joined the Hoot Owls in 1927. He came from San Francisco. He was a good writer. He was a performer. He wrote many of their scripts until the program went off the air. Um, and, one of the th and he wrote kind of doggerel. Um, and one of the things that he did, this was recorded. Harry got into a relationship with, um, some of you may have heard of Olson and Johnson who were Broadway headliners, I mean, big stars on Broadway in the 30s. They did some movies. He got into a relationship with Olson and Johnson, and he wrote some stuff for Olson and Johnson's use, and um, he tried to sell some of his stuff, so he did a private recording. This is what Harry sounded like um, about 1931, and this is what, from his series of called The Oh My Songs, and this is kind of a takeoff on Adam and Eve. Now we're going to go into two months of music for you. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be living in the middle of the world. We're going to be We'll kind of not play all of it. Um, the other piece of, t of, of recording that we have, um, some of you may be familiar with Punch Green, who became kind of Mr. Republican in Oregon. He ran Richard Nixon's um, uh, election campaign in 1966. He was rewarded. Um, he was made ambassador to Luxembourg, I think. Uh, he was very prominent. He died, uh, um, well, I think about eight, 1992. Um, his father, Punch Green Sr., was a hoot owl and who had pretensions for a career. He made one record, and this is what his dad, who was a singer on the program, sounded like.
Um, so this is a Houdal script from November 11, 1932. The topic that's not the standard prohibition. Um, we're going to look at the satiric things on popular topics. The Houdals, um, their, their, their titles, they were stylized as a lodge. And the idea had been that um, kind of like attending a lodge meeting, attendance is mandatory. So they stylized this thing as a lodge because they thought it would guarantee an audience. Um, and the Houdals had just an impressive record. They were the first program in America to work from a um, prepared script, variety show to work from a prepared script. They were the first program in America to go on remote, um, a variety show on remote. They were the first program in America to invite a live, to do a live audience remote in 1923. Um, they were the first program in America to have a quiz segment, Hattie McGuinn, which was one of the Houdals. Um, so um, the program had a lot of significance. Um, the titles that they used for this lodge were crazy titles. Um, the head person in the lodge was the Grand Screech. <laughs> and the Grand Screech was Charles F. Berg, who for many years ran Berg's clothing store down on Broadway. Uh, the building's still there. It has a, a wonderful kind of an Art Deco facade. And Charlie Berg was much of the heart behind the program. Um, when he died, uh, his son tried to take over the program, Forrest Berg, a little bit. But basically, that was the end of the program. And radio had changed. And these guys had been doing this program as a volunteer effort for over 10 years. And it just kind of went away. Um, and has been largely forgotten when it was just a stellar achievement, and especially one that was done um, in a very selfless way as a charitable undertaking for the civic good. Um, so I, th I thought the program was quite remarkable. Uh, just be good today, Fred. Remember, Santa comes tonight, and he knows who's been naughty and who's been nice. <laughs> Ooh, I'm dying! The hunting I will go to get you on it, Wabbit. I don't care how big you are. Come out fighting. I got your booty <laughs> Jack Benny's Maxwell. Mel Blank got his start in Portland. He was a graduate of Lincoln High School. He was 17 years old when he joined the Houdals. A lot of the voices that he created came from that program, and he maintained his association with the Houdals and KGW for decades thereafter. Um, and so it kind of gives you a sense of it was just the conjunction of a lot of things where you had really talented people who were just having a good time doing something that they thought was useful, and it, it just kind of created magic. Um, KGW did a lot of live, uh, large studio programs. Covered Wagon Days was a huge undertaking, uh, kind of an early predecessor of the TV Western kind of genre. Um, they had a cast of over 25 people. From May, amazingly, they took it on remote and did the programs from outside of Portland occasionally. Um, one of the uh, leads was this guy. Anybody recognize him? Chet Huntley, oh. who went from Portland to Los Angeles and from Los Angeles to New York. Uh, he played the romantic lead um, on the program in 1935 and 1936. Um, KGW was a major, major program, a uh, major, major station. Um, music and variety. KOIN, however, was all about music. That's all they did. And so their studios on the mezzanine of the Heathland Hotel were designed for music. And so if you can imagine this, this was, um, it, it was, you know, separate programs based on sponsors' names and, and different themes, but from 9 to 9.30 in the morning, you might have one program that was done by one musical group, and at 9.30 to 10, you would have another that was done by another musical group. And KOIN employed more musicians than all of the other radio stations in Oregon combined. It was a huge musical aggregation. Um, 
on the floor, uh, on the Heathman Hotel Studios, at the high point of the station's activity, they had 130 employees on the mezzanine. Um, and KOIN did not play a single phonograph record, never once, ever, mm -hmm. until 1955, when the decline of network radio and the economics of television began to require that they could no longer employ a staff of that size of live musical performers. Although KOIN was the second last station in the country to disband its orchestra when um, the remaining five or six musicians were let go in 1972. And I'll, I'll tell you a story about that. I was living in Portland at the time and the program director uh, of KOIN was Bill Mears who was a great guy. Bill had gotten his uh, start in network radio. He'd been an actor and a director for NBC in Los Angeles and CBS. And um, <coughs> I was teaching at Lewis and Clark and I got to know Bill and he came to speak to classes of mine and so forth. And so one day I was down at his, by then KOYN was on Southwest Columbia. And uh, I had just gone down to meet with him about something. And it was a, uh, an early summer day, and they were doing a live remote broadcast from the parking lot behind the building. And the Come and Get It crowd, which was the noon program, um, was doing a remote out in the parking lot. And Bill, who was just always had a pipe in his mouth, was kind of smoking his pipe. He was kind of a laconic guy. And he looks down, we're talking, he's looking out the parking lot window. And this audience is all coming in on walkers and in wheelchairs. And st the station was number one at the time, had been for quite a long time. I mean, the ratings were strong. But Bill took a look at that and he said, um, I don't know, in another couple of years, we're not going to have an audience. <laughs> <laughs> and four months later is when they disbanded the orchestra, um, let those people go. Uh, so they would just rebrand their staff musicians according to the names of clients. So Hop Gold was a major Portland brewery at the time. This was the Hop Gold Orchestra. And, and of course, you can see on the music stands, this you know, KYN um, uh, orchestra. Um, I don't know where that was taken. It was not shot in the studios. It's some kind of a Portland remote. Well, after the war, uh, radio had been, you know, um, there were not very many stations in any individual city, and after the war there was a huge explosion of radio stations. Uh, many communities got their first radio station then. The added competition of all these radio stations, and FM was just developing, and TV was coming down the pipe, had a huge impact on, um, on radio in America and certainly in Oregon. Um, KGW is one of the last ones, last stations, to, like KOYN, to still try to do radio in the grand style. This was a program that they did um, in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, they were owned by the Oregonian at the time, and this was a housewives kind of program, and they had, uh, they invited the audience in every morning and did the program live from the first floor of the Oregonian building. Um, however, TV was coming down the pike. Now, Wilbur German, um, who was basically interested in the technology of radio, um, was a very early experimenter in television. So he got a license from W7XAO in Portland uh, in 1927. And at the time, his gimmick was he was going to use the radio signal of KWJJ and the projection equipment at the Broadway Theater as a source for visual images. And Transmittal. It isn't clear that he ever um, actually did this. And when I asked Wilbur about it, he kind of really couldn't call to mind or didn't tell me really how he used this, if he ever actually turned it on. But television was kind of, you know, knocking on the door. It took a long time for television to mature. Um, of course, mechanical television was uh, being developed in places like Meyer and Frank would demo it. But it was not until after World War II um, that television really came forward. And so, you know, at the time you had large projection sets like the RCA on the left and the panel crackers on the right. And this is the part you guys know all about, but I did this for popular audiences more. So the small screen sets like the halocraptors on the right with a five-inch screen 
would use a magnifier in order to be able to display an image large enough for a crowd, for a family to be looking at. And the first television station in the Pacific Northwest was KSRC TV in Seattle. Now, the problem was, it was in Seattle. And there was a guy, Ed Parsons, who um, owned KAST in Astoria. And Ed and his wife Grace went to the National Association of Broadcasters convention in 1947 in Chicago. And Grace said, saw television, and she said, Ed, I want radio, I want pictures with my radio. And Ed said, Grace, the closest television station is in Seattle. It's 135 miles away. There's no way to do that. And she said, Ed, I want pictures with my radio. And if there's anybody who can do this, I know it's you. <laughs> so Ed went back to Astoria to figure out what to do. And he invented the cable television industry in Astoria, Oregon, which is not well known. The National Cable Television Association erected a plaque at the Astor Column in Astoria in 1968, memorializing Astoria, Oregon as the founding location of the cable television industry in America. And what Ed did was he put up, he, he experimented with a lot of propagation things. He figured out where he could get signals. He got you know, antennas that were highly located, and he piped them into his, um, they had a, like a penthouse um, apartment uh, across the street from the Astor Hotel, and he had ordered a Howard television set with a nine-inch screen that he had shipped from Chicago, and on Thanksgiving Day 1948, Grace got her wish, and they watched the sign on a KSRC TV from Seattle in their home in Astoria. <coughs> well, this made headlines. People were really interested. And people just started showing up at his front door because they wanted to see this marvel, this television marvel. And so um, his, his worst fear, I mean, his worst time was, was on December 25th, 1948, when they opened the front door of the, hotel, of, of the apartment. And there were these, this whole family that had driven over from the Hood River. Uh, the Dells, it is. Um, and just, we want to see your TV. Well, he didn't really want to turn them away after they'd traveled that far. But on the other hand, he absolutely lost control of his home life. So he said, i got to do something about this. So he figured out how to run wires all over town, calling it a master antenna system. And he figured if he could install sets in some other locations, he'd take the pressure off of his own apartment viewing location. So they put a set in the window of a, an electronic store across the street, and they put a set in the lobby of the Astor Hotel, and he created cable television. Mm -hmm. And it drew national attention. And he actually started a business to put in cable television systems in other parts of the country. Well, on your television finally arrived in Oregon. Now, Oregon was the large, Portland was the largest city in America that didn't have a television station in 1952. But when the FCC um, created a freeze in 1948 on new television construction, and the reason they did was because the VHF channels that were then available were all going to be used up. And so they wanted to figure out how to deal with that and create a more equitable television opportunity for Americans, the upshot of which was the inauguration of the UHF ban. And so there was a guy who um, had a television station in Cleveland, and he owned the Empire Coil um, Manufacturing Company in upstate New York. And he said, well, what a great opportunity to put the first UHF station on the air in America, um, and I will do that. And he got hold of a license, and he created KPTV Portland Channel 27. And David Sarnoff, the president of NBC, um, was approached and involved in some of this. And um, Sarnoff's, Sarnoff contacted the guy and said, look, I'll give you an NBC affiliation. I will sell you the only UHF transmitter in the world because NBC had developed the UHF transmission system that the FCC adopted. And they had the experimental prototype transmitter in uh, New England. 
He said, I'll sell you the transmitter at cost. I'll give you an NBC affiliation, but you have to sign on in time for the World Series in October of, of 1952. KPTV was licensed in July of 1952. They built the whole station in six weeks. Tower, transmitter building, studios, everything in six weeks. And they beat the October 1st date. KPTV signed down. I talked to the guy who built it, who was the manager, um, and I said, how the heck did you ever do that? He said, well, we work morning, noon, and night. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, how did you, I mean, you were dealing with a kind of a funky technology at those high frequencies. He said, you know, we just kind of muddled our way through and we got it on the air. Mm -hmm. So Channel 27 signed on and there, it was a huge national uh, story because it was the first UHF station in the world. Um, the chairman of the FCC came out for the inauguration. The NBC radio, the NBC television network ran a half hour special nationally inaugurating KPTV. It was saluted during the World Series. It was, the trades referred to KPTV as the petted darling of the television industry at the time. Well, all of that was fine and well, except the KPTV failed. Um, so, but people were very interested in this. Three people signed, uh, standing outside of the client store watching the sign on. Big television, uh, that big uh, newspaper display ads. People invited to come in and watch the inauguration, watch television. So KBTV was the first UHF station. KBES in Medford was the first VHF station um, eight, nine months later. And the, the, the um, contest between a V and a U in Portland was not a fair contest, especially in Portland's mountainous terrain. And for that reason, KPTV ultimately failed. And um, Russ Olson, who was the guy who built KPTV, um, basically said the only way that this UHF could ever have worked at that time would be if the FCC had designated markets. This is a UHF market and had only UHF stations. This is the VHF market. It can only have VHF stations, so there wasn't a competition because UHF was inherently more funky and expensive, and it was just not a fair competitive fight. And KPTV, as a result, moved to Channel 12, and is still there now. Um, then there's Dorothy Bullitt. Um, so if you remember KSRC in Seattle, Dorothy Bullitt um, was the widow of um, a, a wealthy man. Um, she had always had an interest in radio, just from the time she was a child. And she really wanted to buy a radio station, which was hard to do after World War II. Um, they were expensive and not much available. And she found kind of a um, down and out radio station and bought it. Um, and then she was watching that same Thanksgiving Day 1948 sign-on of KSRC along with the Parsons. They were wa both watching this sign-on thing and Dorothy Bullitt was just fascinated by this. So she sent a bouquet of flowers to the studio and said, you know, bravo on your achievement getting the station on the air. Well, the guy who would put the station on the air was in way over his head, and three months later, the wolf was at the door and he was ready to go bankrupt. So he contacted Dorothy Bullock and said, would you be interested in buying this station? And she said, absolutely, without having an idea how she was going to pay for it. So she bought the station. Everybody thought she was mad. But what happened was, a few months after she bought the station, the FCC declared a freeze on VHF stations. And so suddenly, she had a four-year monopoly on television in the Pacific Northwest. She renamed the station KING, and that's where King Broadcasting came from. And that's where a lot of the King Broadcasting money derived because KING was very successful during, uh, at all points, but certainly during the time that it was a monopoly. And then she had an opportunity to buy KGW Radio in Portland and she, she exercised that. KGW was sold by the Oregonian. It's kind of an interesting story and nobody really talked about it and it took me a little while to figure it out. Remember that the Oregonian building at Southwest 6 and Alder was this really imposing edifice that was the first steel reinforced building west of the Mississippi and so forth? Well, 
printing technology had changed and the building was no longer well adapted to the way you wanted to print the newspaper after World War II. So the people who were in control of the paper by then were the heirs of the founders. And here the Oregonian was this really impressive, very successful newspaper. The building that they were leaving was a um, kind of an architectural achievement of considerable note. So they bought a full city block, about 10 blocks south of the, eight or 10 blocks south of um, where they had been. And then they hired Pietro Belushi, who was a world-class architect, to design the building that is still there. And it was great, except for the fact that the building cost two and a half times what had been budgeted for it. They were really trying to make a statement as the heirs of the people who had made the first statement. And by the time they moved into the building, the Oregonian was tantamount to near bankruptcy. I mean, if they didn't do something, they were going to be bankrupt. So that's how the New House organization wound up buying the Oregonian. And as part of that whole deal, they sold off KGW and Dorothy Bullitt bought it. And then she enterprised her way to get KGW television. And there's a Dorothy Bullitt, um, there's a funny story. Um, there was a contest for Channel 12. And the other, one of the other applicants, there were several applicants, but one of the other applicants was Westinghouse, which at the time owned KEX. And Westinghouse had a huge broadcasting operation. They were nationally well known, obviously very well funded. And the license application process went into hearing. So the Westinghouse attorneys see this grandmotherly little old lady come into the hearing room, and she's kind of dressed in a frumpy way, and she's got this kind of old style hat on, and they say, <laughs> this is going to be easy pickings. Well, Dorothy Bullitt was um, no dummy. She studied everything, morning, noon, and night during those hearings. and. Um, and she cleaned their clock. They were absolutely stunned when she got the license. And um, uh, a major associate of hers was asked to comment on all of this. And they said, you know, how did, how did this um, little old grandmotherly kind of figure do this? And his comment was, if you have ever dealt with her, you don't want to cross her. She is a, she's a kindly person and her charitable work and so forth. And when it comes to business, she is just all nails. And you do not want to cross Dorothy Bullock. Um, and, and what she did was she created Channel tw uh, 8, which was in many ways kind of the Tiffany station in Portland. Um, she brought in, she stole actually from KPTV um, a couple of the key people from the call and uh, so forth, and created the legendary news team at Channel 8. And, uh, and Channel 8 kind of ran in that grand style that she had established for it for decades and decades. Um, so that's kind of a, a brief history of some aspects of um, Oregon radio and television history. Uh, the way I've looked at all of this was that there were, for a state that was not the biggest, either in terms of geography or the population. Um, Oregon really had a remarkably rich history of firsts and, and things of great significance. And it was all kind of an important story that needed to be told. And so what I had the great pleasure and, and honor of doing is kind of researching some of this stuff and telling stories. And so um, I hope that the result of it is that, you know, folks in the in, in the state will kind of have a fuller appreciation of the significance of what we've all accomplished together with a really unusual radio and television industry that has developed. Um, I'm happy to, to, to chat with you guys and answer any questions about anything I've raised or not. If you absolutely snuck me on something, I'll have to take out my book and look in the index to try to find, find out if I have an answer to your question. Um, yeah? I just wanted to say, I, I probably had one of the first black and white Televisions on Cape, you know, when it first came to Portland, I had a 21 inch Zenith black and white, paid $650 for it. I have a, um, a 1953 Halicrafters that I bought from the family before KBES signed on in Medford, they bought it, and I talked with them when I got it. 
And, I, and they bought it in, in July, even though the station didn't sign on until August. And I said, well, what did you do with it? Well, they just watched the test package. <laughs> <laughs> this was really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, yeah. um, I have two real small questions. When you showed the picture of KOIN in their studio there, there is a pipe organ that sets over there. Who was the resident organist at that time? Uh, they had, because of the size of the organization that they had, they had several resident organists. And I would have to go back to my book to look I it up. I have a piece of sheet music, and I think I remember, I can't remember the guy's name, but it was taken from there in that organ. Do you know what happened to the organ? Um, I do, but I can't tell you. It, it, the uh, um, Pacific Sound Organization Society, PTLS.org, um, has a list of all of the theater organs pretty much in America that they've been able to track, certainly in the West, and what happened to them. Um, I don't recall what happened to KOINs, but um, they were. Yeah, that's been the know. mystery I noticed. Yeah. I know where a lot of the other ones went, because I was in the business, but oh, okay. uh, uh, I don't know what happened to that one. I will tell you that as part of our collection, we own the last surviving, I don't mean me personally, I mean Jefferson Public Radio, um, we own the last surviving pipe organ in America that came from a network radio production center. It came from the NBC Sutter Street Studios, um, was installed in 1927, it's a Robert Morton, and uh, it was the first pipe organ used in radio west of the Mississippi, because those were the first studios, network studios west of the Mississippi, and it was used until 1942. Do you remember uh, how large it was? It's a 2.6. 2.60. Yes, sir. I can tell you a little personal story about KRM. <coughs> I was living at uh, Wilbur, Oregon, which is seven miles north of uh, <coughs> and uh, I was fascinated with reading it. Uh, it in the mid 30s, I don't exactly know the year. And uh, KRNR, which is the, the newspaper, were building this discussion. And they had it in the basement of the Douglas Hotel. And I went in there. And uh, here's this great big tall guy, about six foot six. His name is Bud Tolles. He had wires and put it all over the floor. How he was going to build up anything out of that, I didn't have any idea. But he did. He, he built this uh, transmitter. And I was lucky enough to be at home in the open with a crystal set. And at that time, my, my brother-in-law had a dance band. And I turned on my crystal set, and here was that band playing. Probably the first broadcast. Okay, right um, I think I, I think I in my book described their inaugural broadcast. So, I, you know, I get some of the stations confused in my mind. I wrote about so many. Um, what I tried to do with the book was identify. Well, I did identify. If somebody comes up with something I don't know about, then I can't make the statement. But I did try to identify every radio station and television station that was ever licensed in the state of Oregon and I identified them in kind of how they came to be. Um, some of them with greater um, um, precision or more detail than some of the others. Um, so I, there are a lot of radio stations in my mind and I could have the wrong side on in mind, but I think I identified from newspaper coverage how they signed that station on. Anybody else have anything? Yes, sir. How much is the book? I'm sorry, the book is 2695. And I would be happy to sign ones for you if you either bought one you already bought or if you want to buy one this morning. Um, it occurred to me when I was driving up that I was totally unprepared for sales because I don't have any kind of credit card machine or any kind of cash that I brought with me to make change. So it would have to be kind of a check deal or I could tell you how to, um, or I could, um, <clears throat> we'd have to work something out. But <laughs> I didn't come up kind of equipped on that side, that business side of the deal. Um, is there any place to order the book online? Yes, the book is online at pioneermikes.org. All one word. Pioneermikes.org. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. No, I think we're giving the big hand, though. Oh,